the Waco Massacre, though the most infamous event in the history of the Davidian Seventh-day Adventists, was nonetheless just a milestone. What was before the Waco Massacre, before David Koresh, before his predecessors George Benn and Lois Roden, even before the 1959 Great Disappointment of the Davidian Seventh-day Adventists? What was before that? Well, let me take you back to the beginning, back to 1844. In 1844, there were thousands of Christians who were often referred to as Millerites after William Miller, who expected Jesus Christ to return to the earth that year. It did not happen, and the Millerite Christians were greatly disappointed. But in spite of the ridicule heaped upon them, many did a reassessment of the biblical scriptures that led them to the conclusion that Christ would return in the fall of 1844. And out of that experience was born the Seventh-day Adventist Church, inspired by the believed prophetic voice of Ellen G. White. That prophetic voice, which was the inspiration behind the Seventh-day Adventist, became silent upon her death in 1915. And years later, in 1929, another voice was raised, that of V.T. Hotef, believed by many in the Seventh-day Adventist Church to also be a prophet. And following his death in 1955, some believe the Rodens assumed the prophetic mantle, which after their deaths, some believed was assumed by David Koresh. That voice was silenced April 19, 1993, with his fiery death, along with 75 other Davidian men, women, and children who died in the Waco fire. What about the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ to those Davidians who still remain? What of their belief now in the prophetic prophecies? What of their comfort and peace of mind assured in the Word of God now? Now from where, from whom, do they find their security? Well, those were some of the same kinds of questions that were raised after the Davidians' great disappointment in the spring of 1959. And though the end was not so tragic as the Waco Massacre, in its own way, the 1959 great disappointment was equally as devastating to the faith belief, comfort, and peace of mind of the Davidians then. I should know I was one of them. I'm Phil Arnold here in Houston, Texas from the Reunion Institute. And today we're going to be talking about something that most Americans have heard about, but they don't know very much about it. 25 years ago in 1993, in Waco, Texas, the federal government surrounded a religious community called the Branch Davidians. And when this episode was over, we had over 80 dead Americans, many of them members of the Branch Davidian Church. Although some of us have heard about this and we know something about it, very few people understand and realize that this group has a long history and tradition in Waco going back over 60 years. Today, we're going to take a look at to, about this tradition and about their past history so that you can realize more clearly that this religious group that was destroyed in 1993 was a religious group that had a tradition, a history, had people serving in the church community for many, many years. Today I have with me Dr. James Tabor from the University of North Carolina who has written a book on Waco. Why Waco? Dr. Tabor is, as I say, from the University of North Carolina and was instrumental in trying to help resolve the crises at Waco in 1993. But we have a special guest with us too, from Southern California, Mr. Dudley Goff. Welcome to the program today, Dudley. Thank you, Dr. Phil. Dudley was actually an eyewitness to many of the things that happened in the origins of this religious community in Waco. In the 1940s and 1950s, Dudley lived 
there at what's called Mount Carmel. So today we're going to find out firsthand from an eyewitness exactly what it was like to be part of the Davidian community. He can tell us about the early origins and history of this community. Mm-hmm. Dudley, we're so glad to have you today. Glad to be us here. Give eyewitness you bet. information yes. about it. Yes. Tell us about your, your first uh, thoughts about uh, Waco and about uh, what it meant to be part of the group. And then we're going to hear some information from uh, Dr. Tabor mm-hmm. that I think will relate this to the American public. Mm-hmm. Well, obviously, it was a shock to me. It didn't impact me quite like it did you and Dr. Tabor, I don't think, because you had a close involvement at the time of the assault on the the Davidians at that time. It impacted me because my history goes way back with them before David Koresh ever came on the scene, before there ever was an entity with um, of, of a branch Davidian as as it was seen there in 1993. Yeah, it wasn't David was born in 59, I think, right? David in 59 was, was almost like coming in really late. He well, wasn't absolutely a, yes, because 59 was the year I left the Davidians because wow, of the tremendous mm-hmm. disappointment that we had, right. having predicted certain events were to take place in the spring of 59, actually okay. April 22nd, yeah. 1959, they didn't materialize. And as a result of that disappointment, which heavily impacted me as it did others, mm-hmm. it's like the Bible says, the shepherd is smitten and the sheep are scattered. Mm-hmm. Oh yes. Well, yes. We, we scattered because those things did not take place. Well, that was the year David Christ was born. Yeah, and that's what Is the that public right? doesn't realize. Yeah. Like, I had never heard of the Branch Davidians. I'd heard of the Seventh-day Adventists on February 28th when the Bureau of Alco- Alcohol, Tobacco, and Farms did that initial raid mm-hmm. out at Mount Carmel. Mm-hmm. But. I didn't know this history that you're even going to tell us. Mm-hmm. And working on the book, I began to learn some of yeah. this. But I want all the people listening to realize most of us heard of David Koresh in 93. He goes back to 59 when he was born. He wasn't mm-hmm. leading any group. He was no. a baby, infant, yeah. newborn. And yet you, at that point, had had your whole history so by adding you to the story, we're getting this incredible living link mm-hmm. to, uh, to the whole story. And I think it's vital to understand. Well, my whole history then with the Davidians ended in 59 when David Koresh was born. Yes. I so see. then I have to take you from 59 back to when I got involved, and I can give you a little bit of information as to what was preceding that. This will be very helpful to us because, and I think to the uh, people around the world who are interested in this whole topic, because it will give us a context to understand what was happening in 1993, Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. uh, it's part of a river. If we can go back to the river and get back to the source of the river, which goes back at least 100 years, we can understand what happened more clearly that way. Yeah. Uh, Mm -hmm. Well, tell us a little bit about the beginnings of what the Davidians were and uh, their origins with the Seventh-day Adventists and some of the leadership there, Dudley. Take, I was raised a Seventh-day Adventist, so I, it goes back before my birth that I'm an Adventist. So that would be That's, like 18... Well, 1931 I was born. Yeah, but this would go back, as you said, 100 years. So back yeah, to the 1840s, 40s, 50s. Oh, yeah, right. right. Yeah, until the Millerite movement, actually. That, it was the Millerite movement, the disappointment that Jesus didn't come in... 1844. Yeah, that was William Miller. William yeah. Miller, yes. Yeah, he was a Baptist that really studied the prophecies of the Bible, the book of Daniel and Revelation. Uh-huh. And there are a lot of numbers there, mysterious numbers. Uh-huh. He tried to put them together, and he came up with a date of 1844. And the expectation was that the Messiah, Christ, Jesus, could come at that time. Well, and it was a huge movement, as I huge recall. Huge movement, really, yeah. Hundreds of thousands of people yeah, were at least... Right interested basically in the new england states yes yeah. is where where it was and i i would yeah. say from my study of american religions it's i'm a more of an ancient historian but i'm interested in 
apocalyptic groups, sure. you know, that think the end is near. Yeah. Miller, in some ways, kicked off this whole history that we have in American religions uh, with the Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses and other groups and even Baptists and evangelicals that are studying these prophecies of the Bible. Like the Hal Lindsey type yeah. of interpretation. Especially Daniel and Revelation, mm -hmm. the two mysteries. Yes, right. And interpreting them. Yeah. So you're the movement, the Seventh-day Adventist movement that you were born into right. already had a hundred year history. Right. When you were born. Absolutely. And because yeah. it came yeah. out of the Millerite That's disappointment. Right. Yeah. And then uh, under the leadership of the founders of the Seventh-day Adventists, that would be Ellen G. White, a woman who wrote more words and more literature than I think any other American uh, female. Mm -hmm. uh, she wrote hundreds of thousands of words. Uh, under her leadership, the Seventh-day Adventist Church grew uh, with hospitals and universities and they continued to publish and try to interpret the prophecies of the Bible. Mm -hmm. Let's say that's from about 1850, uh, and they're still here with us today with millions mm -hmm. around the world. So now how does the Seventh-day Adventist church relate to the Davidians that you okay. became part of? Okay, as an Adventist, we believe that Sister White, Ellen G. White, was a prophetess, mm -hmm. having her first visions at age 17 shortly after 1844, and then the growth of the Adventist church. Somewhere along the line in the late 1800s, my mother's family on that side became Adventists. My mother, mother was born in 1907. So you've got deep roots in this. Deep thing. roots in it, yeah. My dad not so as much. My dad became an Adventist when he was uh, 19 or 20. He was born in 96. He was a Methodist and he became an Adventist, but he came a ver became a very solid, uh, very technical, uh, work-oriented Adventist, mm -hmm. you know. But then we were very strong in the Adventist faith. I was born then in 1931. And, uh, and so out of uh, this deep conviction that Sister White was a prophet and the prophecies that were being taught interpretations of scripture by the Adventists were correct. Ah, okay. But there also were people that came up within the Adventist church that had what they thought was a special message. The German reform movement and there were a number of others, you know. One of them then was V.T. Hotef. And Brother Hotef in how do, you, Southern, how do you spell his name? H O U T E F F. Hotif. Okay. Yeah. Hotif. That must be. Uh, is that a European name? Yeah. He, he he was born in Bulgaria. All right. Then when he came to the United States, the job that he had was selling Maytag washing machines <laughs> in those early years. But I don't know when he joined the Adventist Church or anything. But it was back in the late twenties then. Uh, in Southern California, he was attending the church and very interested in prophecy and so forth. And so, and they're always looking for Bible teachers. So then he started giving Sabbath school lessons and teaching a Bible class, a Sabbath school class on Saturdays. And of course, people were flocking to it because a lot of the things he was talking about was new and exciting and all of this. So he's and, an Adventist, but he's got a new take on yes. some of the... Um, and I'm not sure he even visualized in the very early stages exactly what he was or anything. Yeah, he's he just was, studying the Bible. Why, sure, you know, see. But then he begins to get opposition to he it. He notices see. things. Right. And so it comes to a point then that there is a, a showdown in a sense between him and his teachings and uh, the Adventist ministry, and they were very courteous and kind to him in the early early days, and and he was very amenable too. I mean, he was open to well, what they gave him a hearing. They he gave him listen, a hearing. Uh, they said, "Yeah, you take all the time you need okay. to explain your message, and we will listen." And then he's saying, "You take all the time you need to rebuff it, to prove it wrong." And what's going to be the conclusion of this? They're saying to him, if we prove that you're wrong, then you'll quit recant, in a sense, you know, yeah. see? 
And he's saying, yes, he would, you know. So uh -huh. he's not at that point, or maybe never, you can tell me, but he's not saying, oh, I had a vision and I'm a prophet and I'm replacing no. or going beyond Ellen G. White. He's just studying his Bible it, and right. seeing certain right. interpretations. And to my knowledge, he never had any dreams or visions at okay. all. Like Ellen G. White, she had the, the visions, but he, he never did, to my knowledge. Uh, he never claimed to be... Elijah the prophet. Mm -hmm. We claimed him to be Elijah the prophet as a forerunner of Christ's second coming, much like John the Baptist that Jesus referred to as the Elijah of his day was a forerunner of yeah. Christ's first coming. Yeah, some and of our audience might not know or recall that if you go to the last page of the Bible, of the Hebrew Bible, the uh -huh. Old Testament, is Malachi. Ah, My the book messenger. of Malachi. Yeah. And the last few verses say, before the great and terrible day of the Lord, which Christians all associate with the so-called second coming of Christ. Right. I'll send Elijah the prophet. Yeah. Now, that can't be John the Baptist, the way the people would read prophecy, because John the Baptist was 2,000 years ago. This is right. before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Yeah. Ah. There'll mm -hmm. be Elijah. And guess what? You remember? He's going to restore all these things. Mm -hmm. You're right. Yeah. So I could see how. Now you knew Hadith. Uh, I knew Brother Hadith in, in that but, early stage, yeah. no say. But yeah. as a result of that yeah. dialogue between them, mm -hmm. they said, Yes, we've proved you wrong. He's saying, Well, I'm not satisfied that you have. And the rift began, and then I he see. started off on his own. So he's not going to stop teaching. He's not going to stop Because he thinks all. it's the word of God. Well, what are yeah. the distinctive points of disagreement he had with the Seventh day Adventist leadership? Was it something to do with the, uh, the kingdom of God? Um. I don't know at that point because it primarily would have dealt with the first two books that he had. Yes, uh, uh, Shepherd's Rod, Volume One. This this book here was was his first book, and he goes into the hundred and forty four thousand, the Reformation, and things like that. But uh, there was a lot in there, and their judgment was uh, yeah, error, right, you know. Yeah. Say, well, now it's, it's called the Shepherd's Rod. Why what why why the thing the Shepherd's Rod? Well, Micah 6, 9 says, Hear ye the rod, and who hath appointed it? So, so in the, in the so Old he Testament, took the name, there's yes. a book called Micah. Micah. And in chapter what? In Micah 6, verse 9. And it says something about a rod will speak. Hear ye the rod. Hear the rod. And he who hath appointed it. Hearing the rod, obviously, is a symbol, symbolism, symbolic. But it's the message of the rod, and he took it and applied it to his book, The Rod, The right. Message so of the Rod. This was published while he was not in Waco, Texas, but Los Angeles. Oh, this was in Los Angeles. Very early. And and notice, it says on here, the 144,000, there's the rod. Yeah. A call for reformation. So yeah. it sounds like he's, Adventist Church is more than 144,000. Oh, yes, right, what? yeah. By then, was it a million or two million? Well, well probably uh, uh, three million or more. Yeah, million, so he's know, saying, worldwide. wait, if you hear the rod, which I guess is his message, right. that will reform the church down Absolutely. to this group. Did he take that literally then, that it would be like the true believers in the Adventist movement would number 144,000? Um, yes. Wow. Eventually, it would... That's amazing. It, yeah. it, would reach, it would reach that figure. By filtering out the ones that were not really, uh, really fiercely warm or hot for God. Right. You know. Well, there's where he got the revelation of Ezekiel, the ninth chapter, where Ezekiel tells how the angel is going through the midst of the city, and he makes that applicable to the Adventist church. Because he believed that the Adventist church was God's church, that it was the last church, it was the Laodicean church, and all of that is believed by Adventists and by Ellen G. White. Mm -hmm. But the Adventist church was corrupt too, lukewarm, the Bible says. So explain says. this Laodicean for people that might not know. What is oh, that Laodicean? Okay, there are... Go ahead and, and explain about the seven churches and lead up to Laodicea. Right, well, in the yeah. book of Revelation, uh, you find that the book of Revelation is a revelation of Jesus Christ that's given to John. 
and uh, it, com it consists of letters to seven churches. The churches are in famous cities in Asia Minor. You have Ephesus and you have uh, uh, other cities like Smyrna and Pergamos, Thyatira, Philadelphia, Sardis, and Laodicea. And uh, so the, the message is to go to those churches. Now, you could take those churches, couldn't you, Jim, as literal churches at the back time then. of John. And they were back then. And they were. Churches. Yeah, but, they're, they're on a little mail circuit in what's today Turkey, Asia mm -hmm. Yes. And, and, but, but, but when you read the book of Revelation, it, it's not con it doesn't simply end in the first century. The book is taking you through hundreds and maybe a thousand years into the future. So there's a way of interpreting it that those churches represent different periods of time throughout history yes. when certain characteristics of those churches would be expressed by Christians down through time. Is that the way you would express yeah, it? Yeah, and, and when you get to the seventh one, mm -hmm. which is Laodicea, right. it's kind of a pessimistic <clears throat> picture. Yes. Not only do you have right before that, I'm coming soon, mm -hmm. so you know you're at the end time mm -hmm. if you have this future interpretation, but the church is pictured as uh, in a bad state. Yes. Now this is not for Adventists, Baptists, Methodists, Catholics, so this is talking about the Adventist movement mm -hmm. that was the, they thought, the final movement mm -hmm. where God's calling people into mm -hmm. his truth. So right? the Laodicean yeah. church and, is and it the says end time luke, church. They're lukewarm and they're neither hot nor cold, yeah. and he's going to spew them out of his mouth, yeah. is what it is. So Hotev you know. is telling the Seventh-day Adventists, the millions of members, that you are neither hot nor cold, and the Lord God is going to spew you out of his mouth. Yes. So he's trying to, what, wake them up? That's right, yeah. But who is you? How do you determine who are spewed out and so forth, you know? I mean, that's... that's uh, well, the ones that are lukewarm is what he's saying. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. But see, he believed then, like Adventists believed, that that latency in church was the Seventh-day Adventist church. Yes. Yeah. It's not the Baptist, right. it's not the Methodist, it's not the Catholic. It's or, not Christianity as a whole. Not at all. This little church, the Laodicean Seventh-day Adventist church that came out of the Millerite movement, that God has put his stamp of approval on and proven it through the writings of Ellen G. White, that that is the case. And for Brother Otto to come along and say, well, no, we're starting something else. Uh -uh, that wasn't it, wasn't it. He comes along and says, hey, we're a part of it. Uh, but now God is giving additional light. You talk about the spewing out, the lukewarmness of the Adventist church. What's the next step? How is he going to handle this? Oh, you go to Ezekiel, the ninth chapter, and he says that he's going to send the angel throughout the city, and we interpreted that the city of Jerusalem, that that is the church. The people of God. Spiritualize it. Mm -hmm. But the people of God in the Adventist church, not the yeah, people of right. God in the Methodist church. Right, right. Or any of those, mm -hmm. but in the Adventist church. And that angel would go throughout okay. the church over a period of time and put a seal in the forehead. Of the oh. ones who are faithful. Well, it says on those who sigh and cry for the abominations right. that are done therein, you ah, know, yes. in the church or in Jerusalem, is it? So I'd have thought the time had come, I've heard you use the term the 11th hour. Yes. And God is now going to cleanse and purify the church. Get him ready to do so. And so yeah. before he does that, I think there's scriptures that say God does nothing except he warns. He re re revealeth right. his secrets through his servants the right. prophets. So he felt yeah. like uh, he had been chosen. Right. And, as and that's prophet, a, way yeah. back in Los Angeles. Yeah, that's way back. So how does he back end in up in Texas, of all places? Well, Because um, that's how we know is Waco, okay. Texas. Let me finish up that one part okay. of it yeah, there. See, once the angel is gone through and sealed, all of, all of those that are to receive the seal, that Protected. are trained for, yeah. out for the abominations in there, following that then are what are termed the slaughter angels in Ezekiel 9. And they go and they slay those that are that do not have the seal. And this well, is literal. And that that was literal, very wow. much like with the angel that went through the the camp in uh, Egypt when the Hebrews were about to leave. Those 
that were going to be protected from the angel, the slaughter angel there, put the blood above the doorpost. Right. And wherever he saw the blood, he would pass by, you know. The Passover angel. The Passover angel. Mm -hmm. And that... So I can see why these Adventist ministers and oh. people that were more established that are running the church in all, every state and every conference, this is a pretty rough message. Oh, really? It? Yeah. That, uh, most yeah. of you actually are going to be right. judged. And, and so when you talk about the sealing and then following it, the slain of those that aren't sealed, and wait a minute, who are these? These sealed ones, where else in the Bible does it talk about a sealing? Oh, it's in the Revelation. It talks about 144,000 that are sealed, 12,000 out of each of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Mm -hmm. um, well, we reject the Jews because they killed Christ, so we're like all the other denominations. We're a replacement theology. None of that that has reference to the Jews literally in the Bible really applies to them because they've been rejected since they killed Christ. So that, that was, was the, the that position. Was, that was the position of that, Hodden back then. What, uh, and the Adventists. Back then, and at the Adventists, you know. Because whenever then the prophecies talk about Israel, it's now applied to the It's church. now applied here. And, of course, the, the verse quoted most often for this is where Paul makes a, state, a statement in Galatians that if you're Christ, you're Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. Mm -hmm. So all of the promises made to the Israelites, to the Jews in the last days, bringing them back from all nations, back to their own land, setting up the kingdom and all that, that's it's all spiritualized. spiritualized. Yeah. They were confiscated and right. given over to the And so we took that yeah. as, Ad, as Advents and Davidians as applying then to the 144,000 spiritual Adventists and all there. But a literal fulfillment of it setting up the kingdom. So the 144,000 would then eventually go to Israel, to Jerusalem, to the kingdom. Now that's the hot kingdom. of you. Right. That's hot of you. That wasn't the Adventist, yeah. no. Explain that a little bit. Because yeah. it's well, different from the Adventist from right. that point. Because that's a big point. That's no, a big. It, so you got a slaughter, but you've also got a completely different interpretation of the kingdom. Of uh, yeah. And for them, the slaughter was uh, that, that just... Uh, that, Allegorical or... Oh, yeah, whatever. They just, they, they, they wouldn't accept that. But um, it was the anticipation and... And maybe that goes to the crux of it here before I explain further. That sealing of the 144,000 would continue until a certain time. And Brother Hodge died in 1955. Mm -hmm. Something has to happen, but what? And after his death, there were those of the Davidians, and I was a part of that, that... Um, arrived at the conclusion uh, that we had three and a half years yet to notify, to warn the, the Adventist church of what was happening, at the end of which would come the slaughter. And it was that that I referenced and that we were thinking would happen in April, by April 22nd, 59, 1959. So that, as I recall, in the book of Revelation, those numbers three and a half years, yes. 42 months, Four, yeah. 1260 days. Right. Those are well-known numbers. Well-known numbers, that, yeah. So now you're thinking we're in that very period. That's like right. Like a countdown. Yeah. Hadif is gone. Yeah. And now Then the it comes ticking. up to that. And then and I'm very much involved in that aspect of it. And so when it didn't happen, it was absolutely devastating to me as it was to others. So during, yeah. let's go back though, before and we the, left, before the disappointment, okay, in '59 yeah. April, uh, you don't have a lot of time to get the message out. So I remember you telling us, could you tell about how you went out on trips and you, these charts we have here, I, I, that's I, a, a flip chart and that we used in giving the Bible. So you would get in a car yeah. with a partner and. You travel, yeah. and you're trying to get the word to yeah. the Adventists that the, okay, the hour let me of go, judgment has come, right? Yeah, yeah right. right. Uh, James, let me go back a little bit further then to, to my starting point. And as to your question a moment ago, okay. from 
Southern California in 1929. That's the next step there was Brother Hoff and the few there in Los Angeles moving mm -hmm. the headquarters to Waco. Okay. To Old Mount Carmel in 1935, and there were 12 original persons that came, including Brother Hoff, and came to Old Mount Carmel on the. Did he west feel side. that? Number was significant. Twelve. He did, but uh, what uh, what I read on it, it was it was not planned. What they didn't have any money hardly, so they said mm -hmm. we've got to make the move. We've now made arrangements to get this property, three hundred and seventy-five acres on the west side of Waco, overlooking the bluffs overlooking Lake Waco. There, you know, just cedar and just uh, lousy, you know, rocks and all right. this. No one wanted it, but. We got it for nothing almost kind of thing. See, I don't know what they paid for it, but a minimal amount. So then he says, we're moving our headquarters there, but we, you're going to have to pay your own way to get there. Okay. So he didn't know how many would He didn't know how many going to go. This is people selling things and getting yeah. trailers. Yeah. And so it ended up with 12 people. Well, I could see how he might have been in. I think that number was significant. after after the fact sure. though exactly. after the fact it wasn't planned but that's the way it that's the way it that happened out. and one of those there so that was, was 1931 that was um no 35 35 yeah 1931 was when you were born yeah. yeah right in 1935 that was it and uh one of the persons was a lady by the name of charbonneau mm -hmm. and her daughter and her daughter's daughter her daughter's daughter was Florence. Florence became Brother Hoddiff's wife after oh, okay. they moved to Mount Carmel. She was uh, late 17, early 18. So Mount Carmel's the name of this property you got? Mount Carmel was right. the name of the property, as it was even in, in 93. I mean, yeah. Mount Carmel, except it was a different piece so of property. So that's the real yeah. beginning of the Waco The real story. beginning of it, yeah. Not 1993, but... You're right, yeah. 19, 1935. Almost 60 1935. Years. There is a Mount Carmel in 1935. Absolutely, yeah. And an interesting thing mm. you might find just kind of interesting, that Charbonneau, that lady, when she died at Mount Carmel, she was the first one to be buried in the cemetery in Old Mount Carmel, overlooking Lake Waco. But also, we knew even at that time, or since when I got involved, <clears throat> that she was a descendant of sh the Canadian fur trapper, Charbonneau, who married the Indian girl, Sacagawea, wow. who led the Lewis and Clark expedition uh, to uh, Astoria in 1804, 1805 on that. Yes, yes. She had been kidnapped by one tribe of Indians at 12 years old. And uh, when she was 17 or so, anyway, she uh, was bought by Charbonneau wow. as one of his wives. Mm -hmm. And when Lewis and Clark were there, they're looking for a guide. And Charbonneau speaking French, and this girl speaking the Indian <clears throat> languages, and they're going to go through the territory of her tribe where she had been kidnapped from. Mm -hmm. It turned out when they finally got there, her brother is the chief then right. at that By time. That you know. time. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it's just very so interesting. So here you have a family <laughs> going to Waco, <laughs> a mother, a daughter, and a granddaughter yeah. that have this. Uh, have that is rich thing. piece of American history, <laughs> right? Where they were out on the frontier, right? You know, absolutely, exploring new directions. And Brother Hodiff and the Davidians are exploring new directions this, and new frontiers this is in right. the Bible. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So there was that small number that moved there in 1935 to um, to Mount Carmel, and then they invited more people to come and so forth. It had you to know. be rough. Oh, rough as could be. And we've got pictures of the sketches of the buildings they were building, and, and then we've seen some of the buildings, and just the, they, they were shacks, like chicken shacks. You You're know, printing so. up many, many tracks by the scores of thousands and sending, sending them out. Beginning to do the tracks. Beginning to do that. Yeah. Uh, that was more after they got to Mount Carmel, starting more yes, on the, on the yes, tracks. Actually, right. Shepherd's Rod, Volume 1 and Volume 2 were the principles there to begin with, uh, plus the symbolic code. And they were giving that out. That was like a newsletter thing. Kind of a yeah. newsletter thing and all. There's where they keep people informed of what was happening and, who, and some testimonies and things of this sort. So you're going out eventually 
well, even earlier, but when you grew up, in teaching this. But James, let me go a little further okay. up to that. From yeah, the, go ahead. The 35 there and all. Then I have nothing to do with it. I don't know anything about it. I was born in 31. Yeah, you wouldn't have known. Right. Mm -hmm. But my being raised in Adventist, my mother raised in Adventist. She went to Adventist school, and one of the schools she went with was at Cedar Lake, and a teacher she had by the name of DeVille. Cedar Lake, Michigan. Cedar Lake, Michigan. That's a real Adventist center. Real Adventist community, and there's where I finally went back to and graduated from Cedar Lake Academy. This DeVille became a Davidian. She accepted the, shot or the rod message. Well, she loved her, me her kids and all, and my mother and her had a good relationship. And she kept hounding my folks then to steady the shepherd's rod writings and Brother Hall, you know, accept the new light, oh, you know. Yeah. Say, and of course, my folks were really against it. Well, my mother's health was real bad in Michigan, and the doctor said she needed drier <laughs> climate. So in 1944, we left Michigan to go to Southern California. And being late in the year, we took the southern route more, which took us through Dallas. Well, she, my mom and Sister Davili in Waco, they're corresponding. And it's not that far to Waco. Not Dallas. that far. And Davili says, you guys come by Mount Carmel, Waco. Mm -hmm. No way was my dad going to do that, you know. So. He didn't want to mess with this oh, heretical no. No. teaching. You know? Right. Mm -hmm. So, Develli still wants to see our family, so she finally concedes. She says, okay, I'll come up there. She buys a one-way ticket on a Greyhound bus from Waco up to Dallas, up there to see us, and has no money. She says, I have no way of getting back home. I don't have any money. You're going to have to take me back. Ah. <laughs> and yes. my dad fell for that, ah. you know, okay, said to Develli. And we left the trailer there, got in the car, and drove from Dallas down to Waco to Mount Carmel. And we were there a week. And during that week, Brother Hardiff is giving Bible studies to my dad particularly. Okay. And he became a Davidian. So he was personal. He would week. sit with your father and open right. the Bible. Right, absolutely. And... Really? Yeah, yeah. Wow. During that time. David Koresh did that, remember? Yeah. Oh, Even yes. with some of the FBI yeah. people, yeah. that same thing. That yes. Here, let me show you something. Right. Let me show you out of the book. Right. Yeah. Now, my brother and I, this didn't mean much to us. I'm 13 years old, yeah. my brother 12, but they had kids there. You're probably so climbing. So we're having a ball. Climbing trees, running oh, around. Oh, yeah, going all over the place. And then just it's really neat, really neat. So then we left there uh, after a week and went on to Southern California and then started attending the Davidian congregation there, which was the largest in the nation other than Mount Carmel. There, what city you know, was that in? Los Angeles. Okay, because that's Angeles. where Huddiff had started. That's where it so started, you know, you know. And there's where mm -hmm. I met, we may refer back to this, but there's where I met um, Mary Bell and her mother. She was a child, uh, maybe a year younger than me or so. But we would, they were Davidians, we'd pick them up and take them to the meetings. And so that's how we knew her. She eventually becomes the wife of Perry Jones, who was shot at the entrance with David Koresh when the BATF. On February 28th. February 28th yeah. uh, um, so Perry Jones that was killed in 1993, you knew him? I knew him. And, and way we'll back. touch on that way back, but not that far back. Knew yeah. his wife yeah. that far back. Uh -huh. Didn't know Perry Jones until other things happened that, that we got involved with the Davidian. So that was in 44, and we stayed in California for two years. And in 46, Brother Hart of contacted my dad because he was a landscaper and asked him to come to Mount Carmel. He didn't invite anyone to Mount Carmel unless there was a purpose and they're doing something there other than maybe an older person. He's not just trying restaurant. to gather a bunch of no, people. No, not at yeah. all. You had to have a job and, and needed the, they needed you, you know. Because my dad was a landscaper and Brother Hoddiff was thinking ahead. He was preparing. We had 375 acres of Mount Carmel there and a lot of ravines and whatnot. And so it got the big bulldozer. I remember when the new one came into Mount Carmel, $5,000 they paid for this, this big bulldozer. Wow. Which was, uh, they'd had an international one before that. But anyway, 
brought my dad there to build the outdoor stadium that would seat 144,000. That is remarkable. That to is build, build a stadium, a, a stadium, outdoor stadium. amphitheater, yes, and all just the dirt, you know, and they would, it would be terraced and down, the, and so you would sit on the grass. I've seen my dad leveling it out with water, you know, so it was just the right. So he started working on it. Oh, this. yeah, yeah. Amazing. When, now, when, when, when Brother Hall brought us there. Well, you, you talk know. about taking the Bible <coughs> literally. It's yeah. one thing to sit around and speculate. But to say, you know, they're going to, this remnant group is going to come, and we'll get to where later you're going to go to Palestine, right, and to yeah. Israel, and be part of the kingdom of God and so forth. Right. But to think they're actually going to come to Waco, Texas. Hey, yeah. I was going to say now, uh, with people listening who are Catholic, Baptist, Methodist, I don't think when you go to your church, you sit around reading verses that talk about a how 144,000 new members could be seated in some kind of stadium that your church needs to build. Mm -hmm. Why is that? What's the difference between your approach and what we're hearing today? There's, as Dr. Tabor says, you have a, you're really concerned with what the Bible predicts will happen, mm -hmm. and you're taking those passages very seriously. Mm -hmm. You're looking at Hebrew, Greek, you're studying the passages to find out, do we need to build a facility to house 144,000 human beings? Mm -hmm. Or does that mean angels? I mean, you're discussing all this. Right, yeah. And you conclude that the 144,000 are... The, the, at the Adventists that escaped the slaughter of Ezekiel 9, the ones that are sealed by the angel, human the sealing beings. angel. Well, human coming, beings. Coming Absolutely. to wake up. Absolutely. So Absolutely. you're looking for 144,000 yeah. new members. Yeah. Well, and but it wasn't the case where we thought that you accept the shepherd's rod message and boy, you are locked in. You are, you, you, you're going to have the seal. That seals you. No. You, you still had to uh, be qualified. I mean, you had to live a proper life and right, everything. Right. You know, only God could determine that, see. Right. So um, many Davidians would be slain in, the, ah, in that, as well as right. Adventists. It wasn't that clear cut. Right. So we knew that we were going to be the reason. All of the Adventist church, including us who had become Davidians, had the possibility, had the chance of receiving the seal of God. We also had the alternative possibility of being a part of those that are that are slain. You know, that wouldn't be a part of it. You know? So there's a yeah. testing and a purifying yeah. process. Yeah. Same thing we find with David Koresh mm -hmm. and the Branch Davidians not wanting to come out at Mount Carmel because God is working a process. There's a waiting period where the Sheep can be separated from the goats, and there can be a purifying process going on for mm -hmm. people inside. So that theme runs way back mm -hmm. into uh, Davidian tradition. See, yeah. we actually used that when Phil and I approach David through the tapes that Dick DeGuerin took in and so forth. They were mm -hmm. directly addressed to David. Mm -hmm. uh, first a radio program and then a tape, and we use that because what we, it's a different idea, but it's very related, Yeah, is that uh, I said to Phil something like, uh, well, Phil, you know, before February 28th, I'd never even heard of David Koresh or the Davidians. You hadn't. We'd even studied American religions and universities. And now he's on the cover of Time and mentioned Newsweek, and he's mentioned every night. The Branch Davidian siege is in day 32 or whatever. Yeah. So we, we knew he was listening. So sure. I would say something like this to Phil. Mm -hmm. Well, Phil, you know, I think he believes that there's going to be 144,000. Well, he only has 130 people. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. So he's probably thinking this. We're trying to get into his mind. Right. Not that we believed it, but how to deal with him. Right, yeah. He probably believes that this notoriety... He's become a household name yeah. overnight. Right. And so that, and yet people don't know his message. Right. Mm -hmm. So our pitch for him to surrender and come out, which he agreed to, mm -hmm. he signed an agreement. It was yeah. all done. Yeah. Was because he was thinking, okay, this is probably the case. Yeah. Now, if I publish my message, just like 
Shepherd's Rod back mm -hmm, then. Mm -hmm. There will be 144,000 people. I don't think he was as exclusive with just the Adventists because mm -hmm. he had pulled people from all over. All over. Mm -hmm. but, but on the globe, there will be 144,000 that will see this message and read yeah. it mm -hmm. and decide that's a prophet of God mm -hmm. or that's sure. the, mm -hmm. the yeah. Lamb of God. So mm -hmm. at, that would happen so we after, after, that. after he yeah. surrendered and yeah. he would, he would uh, go to trial. Mm -hmm. And maybe go to prison. All the, the this work of God uh, sealing 144,000 would be transpiring, and he would be there watching it and then participating in it as it came to its culmination. Yeah, yeah. because there wasn't a chance that that teeny little group, 130 people, yeah. was going to have any worldwide influence right. without something happening. Right. Yeah. So I think yeah. he thought that over, mm -hmm. and uh, actually it was Passover. Uh, it was a week before. Uh, it was a, the week after Passover on a Wednesday, April fourteenth, hmm. and he said, "I've got, I've got the word now. Yeah. We're coming out. Yeah. But I have to write this message." So, see, uh -huh. we, we're pretty sure that he, I don't want to say went for it like it was a trick, right. but right. found this suggestion uh -huh. persuade, uh, persuasive. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. I, like I think he did, yeah. and I think he wanted to dialogue with us further. So we did because need, he says yeah. once he gives his manuscript. To, to us. the attorney and gives it to us, gives yeah. it to mm -hmm. us yeah. names us by name, yeah. they would come out. So right. this fire that's on the cover of my book here, mm -hmm. everybody's seen that image. Right, yeah. That totally unnecessary. Right. That did not absolutely be, and these little children yeah. should be alive today. That's now right. whether they want to believe Davidian message or not right. believe or whatever, that's mm -hmm. another question. Yeah. They shouldn't be dead. No, yeah. no, they, they shouldn't. shouldn't be dead. And uh, yeah. this church community goes back then here, we're in 1935, and then uh, your father comes along later, brings yeah. the children, and he's sure. building this theater or this amphitheater, so this stadium yeah. for 1946. Yeah. So please continue. What happened? Okay. Then? Uh, then I stayed at Mount Carmel mm -hmm. for uh, two years, and I won't go into a lot of things right now, but maybe later if there's something you want. But uh, I was there for two years, and uh, my main job was uh, in the bakery, and so I was mm -hmm. in charge of that. I had close relationship with Brother Hardeth because of things he was having me do, developing food, the first granola that you would probably have. Really? We would have had there, you know, okay. I mean, starting. But we'll go into that later. So it's at the, in 1948, that's two late, days later, uh, two years later, and my folks were not having, things weren't going real good between my folks. And my mom left, and with her family and all in Michigan, goes back up there. And so she and the family are wanting to get me out of Mount Carmel. And so they're making arrangements for me to go to Cedar Lake Academy, which is a boarding school, an Adventist school at Cedar Lake, and which I did for two years. My 11th and 12th grade I took there. Because of my experience at Mount Carmel and the baking, Then, and I needed money to go to school at, at Cedar Lake Academy, then I had the job, I was in charge of the bakery and everything there at Cedar Lake. So I was able to make a living and get me, to get me enough mm -hmm. through, through class and all, and graduated from there in, 19, in 1950. And then I was headed in the summer for Emmanuel Missionary College, Andrews University, as you refer to it now. You were gonna be a minister. I didn't know what I was going to do then. But I thought the chances the Bible, were pretty yeah. good. I would be a, a chef in an Adventist school, a okay. college, or something like that. I wasn't sure. But anyway, toward the end of that first semester, I decided I want to go back to Mount Carmel. I wasn't comfortable about everything. So I went back Christmas of, uh, of 1950, it'd be 50, almost 51. So you felt, you felt a pull. I felt a pull to go back. But I didn't trust myself. <clears throat> enough to to be able to make the break because mm -hmm. I was go I went back with my mother and drove her that whole distance from Battle Creek Michigan down there and uh, but left all my stuff I couldn't trust myself to go back to Emmanuel Missionary College and get the stuff without them talking me out of it mm -hmm. so I got one of the the young men at Mount Carmel to go with me and borrow my dad's pickup and drove back to Berrien Springs. Well, now I'm committed. 
he's with me. I've got my dad struck. You got to go back. Yeah. I've got to go back. Yeah. And they tried in every way mm -hmm. under the sun to get me to stay. And yeah. I think they mm -hmm. they probably would have succeeded if it hadn't been yeah. for that. Mm -hmm. But I returned to Mount Carmel and then got quite immersed, involved in things that were going at, on at Mount Carmel and feeling hey, that's where God wants me. And then they paired me up with M.J. Bingham, one okay. of their leading theologians. Yeah, I've read about him. He was major, read about major. Really major in the early years there particularly. So um, I went with him around the country. Uh, so you're like a Bible Paul studies. and a Timothy or something. Paul and Timothy. And I felt like it. I felt like I was Timothy, and I admired this man so much in his ability to give Bible studies. I learned to, to give Bible studies from him. So and, and we had tr and unbelievable were you using experiences. Using charts like these back in those days. So. Well, no, we weren't using this. We didn't have those back then. It was only after I. Mm -hmm. um, after two but, or three years. But you were and, going and visiting. Explaining right. Daniel and Revelation. All of that, and going yeah. Through these and the details. shepherd's rod. You know, the shepherd's it. rod. And but mostly me not explaining much. Mostly just being there to help Brother Bingham. He had a bad sure. foot. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so he kind of needed someone with him quite a bit. And he was very tall, 6'4 mm -hmm. or so, you know, and had a cane. And everything about killed him a couple of times. And. <laughs> Here I am, a 19-year-old kid, you know, and I tell you some of the funny things that happened. But um, so but you oh, are really getting convinced. Oh, really? More so. and more. This is it. This is the final message. We're very near. We were up in Canada among the Ukrainians, mm -hmm. giving Bible studies there. But but they were Adventists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, see, Adventists are worldwide. The Northwest, yeah. they're worldwide. So when you returned then to Mount Carmel, and you became more persuaded, more convinced, more committed, more. Uh, into the spirit of what was going on, you were able to sit there and personally listen to Brother Hadith. Right. What was that like to you at that time, looking back at Well, how it doing? isn't even just then. Um, probably where the feeling was the strongest before I ever left a Mount Carmel to go to Cedar Lake. Um, uh, we didn't bring any of the timely greetings with us, but I would sit there in the chapel and Brother Hardiff would come out and come out with his Bible and open it up in whatever scripture he was going to be wor working from there. And, um, and his wife was seated in the front on the left-hand side. Florence. That know. was Florence there. We didn't have recorders then, mm -hmm. but she was very good stenographer and typist and all this. But she was taking in shorthand every word he, he spoke. Then later on in the week, they would go ahead and transcribe that, edit it, and, and every other week they would put it into a timely greeting. So there'd be two messages in a timely greeting. Okay. And those were sent out to the field all over. But so I was, people all over that believed or were on the way to believe. Yeah, and many that didn't, you know, if we had their addresses and all. They was that a timely greeting? Oh, yeah. it was a timely greeting. But I would sit there <clears throat> and listen to Brother Hardiff, and as a young, you know, here I am, what, 17 or so at that time, listening to him, I... I can't say I felt like I was in the presence of God. I mean, I wasn't looking at God. It wasn't God speaking necessarily. But what a privilege for me to be here to hear the words of God coming through his prophet, his latter-day prophet, the, the Elijah, Elijah of Malachi, yeah. of Malachi yeah. that precedes the second coming of Christ. I mean, I would just, and so I just drank in every word, you know, I mean, but it was the aura of it. It was the uh, the spiritual high, or whatever you might call yeah, it. But it, it wasn't because he was. Because you've told us this, it wasn't because he was this flamboyant. Oh, not at all. Orator, or he wasn't that. It was more just opening the Bible. This is right. Going through. Very calm. Now that's and, so yeah. interesting for '93. Oh yeah. Because see, we didn't know Koresh and all. Right. We started listening to the tapes. And he also, maybe they had a similar style, it could have been part of the culture. Uh -huh. The thing that was important wasn't, you know, your voice or being this charismatic speaker or anything like that. It was literally 
uh, who's the angel that comes from the east in Isaiah yeah. and who's this and uh -huh. what you said earlier. Yeah. Where else do we hear or read about a sealing? Oh, maybe yeah. uh -huh. Revelation 14 and yeah. Yeah. 11 and so forth. Yeah. So it was more that putting the puzzle together. You felt like you were right. getting knowledge. Absolutely. And when we talked, uh, I was going to say this earlier, I'll put it in here, that um, everybody's like, why won't they come out? I'm talking yeah. about 93. Why, yeah. don't, why don't they come out? Big question people yeah. ask. Yeah. Yeah. Why didn't they come out? What's wrong with them? Are they brainwashed or what? Mm -hmm. And what we found uh, consistently, even during the siege, because they put out a <clears throat> set of videotapes, uh, interviews, where they just ran a camera and said, like, hey, Phil, what brought you to Mount Carmel, and why are you oh, yeah. here, and do you want to come out? And, and they didn't sound brainwashed at all, but yeah. almost every one of them would say, well, I'm here because I was a lot of them Adventist and I studied sure. the Bible, but now this teacher has shown me the way to put these things together. Now, uh -huh. of course, David claimed to even go be, he, he believed in Hadith very much. Oh, yes. yes he, he, he claimed to be the seventh and final messenger yeah. to whom all the mysteries of the prophets were revealed, uh -huh. you know. Yeah. And so they, they felt that, and the FBI got those tapes. There are two of them. Mm -hmm. I think they're on YouTube now. You can watch them. Yeah, videotapes. Yeah, videotapes. And they said, don't let these out to the public. So we didn't know till after they were dead. Right. Right. Yes. Because he said it will create widespread sympathy yeah. for the human side of the Davidians. Because yeah. they're just talking... Yeah. And by the way, uh, I want to point this out. Um, if you look at who was there, a uh, couple of them, Steve Snyder, a uh, graduate degree. Yeah, Wayne Martin. Biblical studies, Wayne Martin, a Harvard lawyer. Yeah. I'm not saying they're all that way. No, no. Um, right. Livingston Fagan. A diverse uh, community. Graduate school in English, England. So, Hispanic, It Jewish. was a Bible... I would describe it as a bi intensive Bible study community that lived together, prayed together, and studied together. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like that's coming directly from this mm -hmm. heritage. This is not just a church you go to on Sunday and Wednesday, right. and you know, kind of believe. This mm -hmm. is this is. Uh, there are students. Uh, what did the students of the Seven Seals, Bible students, yeah. Uh, yeah. words like that describe? I think what Hadith was doing. Yeah. Well, it was back at about that time when I had returned and, and after Brother Bingham that uh, Brother Hart have started the Davidic Levitical Institute, which, which was the, the school to train workers to go out in the field. To get Brother, this message out. Right. Yeah. I had personal training because I went with Brother Bingham, who was one of the key person, most talented, educated from that standpoint, you know. But that was the beginning stages. Well, we need a lot more than that. Yeah. So then the Davidic Levitical Institute, so a lot of young people were involved in that. Well, there was Perry Jones. Really? He then was one of the students there. He's two years older than me, but he was a colleague with me. Now see, there's that continuity, direct the con continuity yeah. with the people that right. died at Wakefield. Because he's the he, one that shot and killed on February 28th. That's right. He was the one that was shot there with David Koresh. And the father of, of David, David's, that was the postman that tipped the Davidians yeah. off that the feds were coming. And the father of, of David's his wife. wife. His and wife. David David Koresh's wife. Uh, uh, well, yeah, but also Grace. he then uh, he was the husband of Mary Bell that I knew back in 44. Yeah. Yeah. It's all connected. California. It's all connected. All connected, yeah. yeah. And I want to I want to say, just so we're clear on this, I mean... When we're, what we're trying to do and what yeah. you're helping us to do, Phil and I as scholars, we don't, you know, we, what we think personally about all this is irrelevant, but we're not advocating this movement and this is the truth or David was called or Hadif was called or any of this. Mm -hmm. And you, you didn't stay with it and you're going to relate that. Yeah. But what's important to do, no matter what we think, I could be an atheist or a believer, it wouldn't matter. Yeah. Same approach, is to approach and understand people where they sincerely find themselves, yeah. rather than to castigate them and label them as crazy brainwashed fanatics, cult members, mm -hmm. 
you know, nuts and fruits and all these kind of pejorative terms, yeah. because that's what got people killed. Mm -hmm. That that cult label. Mm -hmm. um, yep. And, and so, I want everybody to know as you're listening to us, we have tried to get into that worldview in order to understand what went wrong. Right. And we'll talk about this more toward the end, but. We, we think there's some positive light in the future on dealing with groups mm -hmm. in terms of the government yeah. because we've had meetings with FBI sure. and things mm -hmm. have been changed. But you're helping us to really understand mm -hmm. what it felt like. Mm -hmm. um, so you spent, I want to go back to Hadef though because he's gone. Yeah. And what was it like just talking to him, being around him? What was his personality? Okay, I've got, stories? I've got to give you a, a story here, and I was so impressed with it. Brother Hoff ought to have was strict in a lot of ways, you know, and we had a dress code, and we had our own money, and, you know. The, what do you mean your own money? We made our own money. Uh, we made like our own script, money. Like script, yeah. Right. And we'd have a, a card for eating that would, for the cafeteria. I didn't need it that much because I, I worked in the you kitchen. Chef, you know, yeah. see, I was a... <laughs> so yeah. you're paid that way. They didn't have to come up with outside funds. Absolutely, say, yeah. Here's your thing for your meals right. and here's this. And right. When we first went there in 1946, um, because I wasn't in the cooking end of it then, it's my dad that they're concerned about in making the this, the um, outdoor amphitheater and so forth. Uh, but these kids have something to do, so they put me to work with Brother Berliner from Switzerland, uh, who was hard of the in charge of the Avery, the um, the bees, you know. Okay. And so you'd make the little squares with the wax on, you know, for the bees. And I was paid 17 cents an hour. In the script. <laughs> in, in the script for yes, that, see. Yes. But you could buy a ticket for $5 of the script, buy a ticket that would last you about a week in, uh, in the cafeteria. You can buy a $3 one or a $5 one. A $5 one for hungry people lasts about a week. <laughs> and they'd punch it one penny for a slice of bread and, you know, <laughs> different things, you know, see. It was that. But we had our lives to live. I mean, interesting things happening, but one that was real interesting, we lived in a trailer, my brother and I and my mom and dad, and we we're on the edge. We're down in the, we showed you in the, the pictures of in camp. Yeah. And then the main administration was about a half a mile away oh, yeah. up, uh, you and know. By then, you've got some good buildings. Oh, yeah, by yeah. then, some good yeah, buildings. Right. But we're down in camp close there and with our trailer, but we're at a precipice that sort of led down to that dam, dam to what I was telling you about in the farm and the barn that they made there and the pump house and the dairy and all of that, see, quite steep. But we were in a trailer 26 feet long and I decided I don't want to stay in the trailer anymore and I went into one of the trees that was on this precipice and built a tree house. All right. So I was living in this tree house. Well, I got a little more ex uh, interested in, in the radio. I wanted to listen to the radio. So I strung a copper wire 125 feet in length through the trees from my tree house, ah. got a little crystal, a crystal set, and I could listen to the radio stations, ah. the two, WACO and KWTX. <laughs> All I could get, but they, that was kind of fun and exciting. Mm. So I'm living this way, doing my thing, and, and Brother Hardiff hears about it. <laughs> so he calls me to come up to the apartment there to see him, and that was after work and in their apartment, and I'm in his kitchen there, and Florence is doing dishes or whatever, and he's sitting there at the table, and, and just as nice as could be, and you know, we chatted a while, and and I'm sitting on the floor with my back against the wall. And finally he said, Dudley, he said, I understand you're living in a, in a tree house. <laughs> uh, I said, yeah. And uh, so he talked about that a little bit. The way he treated me was phenomenal. I just, um, a, 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 a terrific father-son relationship. So it was, he wasn't reprimanding you. No, was, not at all. He but kind. he was telling me, he said, hey, we're not monkeys. You know, <laughs> right. He said, you can't live in the treehouse. Yeah. 
And um, so after discussion, a bit of it, and I didn't argue with him or anything, uh, it was that um, I have to tear down the treehouse and not live there anymore. I probably, that was um, probably 16. Okay. Yeah, so he had yeah. a way of uh, persuading you oh, in a yeah, kindly Yeah, way. but it's so kind. Mm. And I saw him there. And he wasn't flamboyant. Like we talked about in speaking, he wasn't flamboyant. Right. Mm. But he mm. also was not looking for attention, pictures and all. Almost never let anyone take a picture of him. Really? I really had to con him in almost to <laughs> that one picture of me and him and another of, the, of my buddies there. And you've seen that picture, you exactly. know, the three of us. Uh, um, and I finally <laughs> was able to talk him into doing that. But he was, he was not uh, arrogant, cocky, um, lorded over anybody. He never claimed to be Elijah the prophet, per se. He never said that. We said it. We believed it. So he didn't it. walk in the room, here's right. Elijah. <laughs> yeah, none of that. None of that kind of thing. So I, I really love Bella. Yeah, what, if well, I really you, respected you mentioned him. Florence. She's younger, I think. She's quite a bit younger. Uh, yeah. What what was she like, um, personality-wise? Because later, after he died, you even knew her better. Oh, yes, yeah. What was her, uh, give us a feeling about her? Uh, she was very knowledgeable of Scripture and uh, very kind. She wasn't an arrogant person. I had to work with her a lot with the 11th hour call when I finally got into that. I guess we'll go into that in a minute. But that was a radio program. We'll the radio that, program, yeah. yeah. Uh, but, uh, yes, uh, a very gentle, kind person. Um, you saw her interacting with other office staff and all. You didn't mm -hmm. see any competition or irritation or anything like that, you know. It was Pretty bright, uh, studious kind of person. Oh, well, very, very bright, yeah, my land. She could do, in typing, she could type 140 words a minute on manual typewriters, which you had back then, you know. Well, that's as fast as you'll talk. And of course, she knew shorthand and because she took all of his his messages there and everything. But it came to the point where the school graduated enough individuals and Mount Carmel decided that it was important that uh, they be sending people out as well as just mailings. Mm -hmm. So they started the field workers ministry. And about this same time, then to finance it, uh, they were selling off building sites on Old Mount Carmel. That would help finance, and by this time, people are more interested in the nice views overlooking the lake and of Lake Waco and all, you know, so it wasn't a desolate, desolate snake-infested area like it was when we bought it. Mm -hmm. And so, as a result of that, then they were able to finance the work into the field, these workers going all over, giving Bible studies to, uh, to Adventists, and then... Uh, but needing property, so then they decided to buy a piece of property over on the other side of town where this all happened, 941 acres, what they bought yeah, there. Yeah, so we should just explain, the, use okay. the term Old Mount Carmel. So Old where Mount you Carmel first came as a new. kid is the main camp. Is the Old Mount Carmel, But then yeah. eventually you sold some of that, and there's another property. Yeah. And that's where, uh, where later. Where crash was. Yeah. After yeah. Near Elk. The, after Elk, the 59 Elk, disappointment Elk, and all that, right? Yeah, people were over there. Yeah, so uh, selling off old Mount Carmel helped to pay for new Mount Carmel. Okay. It also helped to pay for the field work going out. Yes. Okay. But then, after we're out in the field for a while, giving Bible studies, then uh, the office decided <laughs> that they they wanted to expand into radio, and so we did a few trials. And, and I was in the Northwest at that time, and so they asked me to do it, and um, the first, uh, and they entitled it the 11th, the 11th Hour Call. This oh, is yeah, our the radio, radio log. Radio yeah. log. Yeah. Here, the, the 11th, 11th hour, call. hour Call radio log, and you can see it's page after page. Uh, did you hook up with a... Uh, well, we didn't to begin with. We started KWJJ in Portland, Oregon, um, on it to begin amazing. with, but then after a little oh, bit... After a little bit of this, then they decided they wanted to expand, and so they called me in from the field 
back to Mount Carmel. So we would, they would originate at Mount Carmel. And so then I became the spokesman, the preacher for the 11th hour call. And another young guy that was out in the field, he then was the announcer. The, I can still hear station. your radio voice. Oh, is that right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> You uh -huh. definitely have that uh, yeah. well, broadcasting yeah, well, I, voice. I take it as a compliment. <laughs> uh, but um, So you got in with, what network was it, ABC? ABC Network. Wow. Yeah. Because this is really blanketing the country. Yeah. And that's in yeah. the early 50s. Right? Yeah. 59. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. So there's where then I started working with Sister Heart of more and more. Yeah. Uh, because uh, I so wrote the messages. Just, just after the disappointment then. Well, no, well, May '59. Uh, yeah, but no, this was uh, yeah, that was still there, you know. Okay. But it, it was but all the broadcast before. was earlier. All yeah. the broadcasts yeah. were earlier, and, yeah. and uh, that. Um, okay. So you're working with Florence. Down. And working with Florence, and so everything had to be approved by her. So I prepared the message that I was going to give this week, a half-hour message. But then she would go ahead and edit it, and if there, uh, if there should be any errors, uh, theologically or any, any other way, she would handle that. So she and I wa worked very closely together. In fact, my home was a home right next to the office. I've shown you pictures of that, yeah. which is the same thing you see with David Koresh at the group there, that same building. Uh, but working with her was just so neat. I mean, it was you know, just hand in glove, and she was so... <clears throat> kind and helpful and so that was my relationship with her probably um, was the greatest at that time you know though I after the disappointment everything else years later after she left the Davidians and moved to California we married them went up the Northwest and her brother and and her and his wife up there with them we would see them okay, quite often you know all yeah. remain friends you know so as we're going there to around 1950, 51, 52, the radio program's going. Now, with, with all this going on, you're, the group is living with the expectation that 144,000 people are going to be gathered, mm -hmm. that, that there's going to be a kingdom of God established in Jerusalem, out of Israel, mm -hmm. and that the Seventh-day Adventist church would be purified many of them actually die mm -hmm. as God's judgment falls upon that church. Yeah. And that's the, that's the faith that's motivating the community. Right. It's causing all these details about who's shelf and building this building and creating this printing press and radio. It's right. coming out of this faith right. that you really believe that God is put is in right. the Bible. Yeah. You're living with that. Yeah. And Hadith is telling you that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. He's the voice that's proclaiming it. That, He's giving the rod message. That's right, yeah. And then we get closer and closer to 53, 54, and Brother Hadov dies. He, he dies in 55. That had to be a disappointment. Oh, it was a disappointment, yeah. Oh, it really did. I was groups. in the field at the time, you know, and uh, when I say in the field, uh, some of the field workers. I happened to be in the east at that time, in the Carolinas somewhere, I think, when that happened. And and he then, wasn't old, was he? No, he was He uh, was almost 70 when he died. He was 69 oh, wow. or something. Okay. Yeah. So he was, you he know, wasn't up old, there. old, but he no, was... No, but uh, up there. And health not real good. But it's still, upon his death, we still felt we had to keep going. In fact, became more involved because, and I had nothing to do with the determination of this, but I, I believed it was right with Florence and the council uh, determining that uh, from approximating, approximately his death, there would be 1,260 days or three years, three and a half years, yeah. that we had to get this message out. Yeah. So nobody, before, gave, you didn't give up the belief in it. You actually when ramp, he died, ramped it up. It wrapped it up. Yeah, it was it up. Ramp, ramped up, yeah, yeah. you know. And, but the thing of it is, it didn't come up to the date and we spiritualize or anything. It, this is going to happen. The, the news tomorrow morning is going to be hundreds of thousands of Adventists found dead. Yeah, that's so shocking. you're looking for see, a literal fulfillment absolutely of prophecy see, yeah. that people are going to perish 
Absolutely. Just like the ancient Egyptian firstborn parents Absolutely. in the Exodus. Yeah. And when you know without a shadow of a doubt and have all the proof of it as you see it, that this is going to happen, and that day coming it doesn't happen, mm -hmm. you're, you're not spiritualizing it or anything else. All you're saying is we're wrong. And yeah. that was devastating know, to me. You didn't yeah. know beforehand, but someone later figured out that that was actually mm -hmm. Passover, which makes it even more chilling to think, because the yeah. whole image of Passover uh -huh. and, this, and it ended up on the Jewish calendar being Passover, uh -huh. April 22nd. But we never knew that. But you that didn't then. know that till later. N not at all. But so, well, yeah. can you tell us about that day? Because I, I, I read. Uh, that you actually were one of the speak, you know, you, people are coming, maybe 500 to 1,000 people had gathered waiting mm. for something to happen. Yeah, there yeah. were about 1,000 there. They called it Tent City. And you were one of the speakers in the tent. Uh, yeah, yeah, I was the principal speaker, partly because I was the speaker on the 11th hour call. So, yeah. I mean, I did yeah. a lot of them, but yeah. others spoke also, other of the workers. And you showed and us, on. do you have their... You put out that we feel that world conditions um, are such in line with prophecy that uh, all nations are soon to gather against Jerusalem battle. In fact, we expect that to be the spring. And with the right, fire, yeah, like the Waco papers are covering. Yeah, but TV your, was out there. TV's they out there. Pictures, yeah. you know, really? Oh well, yeah. It's crazy apocalyptic group yeah. thinks that. And they interviewed me even there at right. one time out there. It's on your, I think it's on Waco Rules of Engagement. I think, I think that little yeah. clip of so, that. So yeah. to be sure the audience is following this, uh, April 22nd, we're, 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 right. say, we're saying that in 1955, Brother Hadif dies. Right. And then you find in the Bible a prophecy that talks about 1,260 days later, a big event would take place. That's three and a half years. The right. ceiling so, of the hundred so thousand. So three and a half years later, mm -hmm. I mean, you're you're waiting year by year, year by you're getting one year goes by, two mm -hmm. years goes by. Mm -hmm. We're three years now. We've got only another six months. That six month ends. The three and a half year year ends mm -hmm. April twenty second, mm -hmm. nineteen fifty nine. Yeah. So as you get toward that date, TV media yep. members are gathering. That's right. And, you and the field workers all called in. Called in. Yeah. This is a momentous time in Absolutely. the history uh, of, the, of the Branch Davidians, of the Davidian Seventh-day Adventist Church. And you're called the, the Davidian Seventh-day Adventist Church. Davidian Seventh-day Adventist officially at that time. Uh, the branch was not until later on. A little after, later yeah. on. So you're gathering on that day, and you become the chief speaker, really, the spokesman. Now, here's the statement. Now, this is after... April 22nd, when yeah. the group had to tell the world, well, what happened? Yeah. And I noticed here it's got five points. I won't go over all of them, but it says, here's what we're expecting sometime this spring after April 22nd. Mm -hmm. So there's a little fluidity. A little bit. As mm -hmm. I recall Florence, the wife, when she, when she figured out what day to begin with, it's when she began to understand it. It wasn't exactly his death date. Not on his death. It had been his death date. It's sealed. It just count from the day he died. But it's, yeah. it's a, there's some time, maybe a week, two weeks, even a month or two. Mm -hmm. And the main thing is it says a terrible judgment will come on the Adventist church, which you've talked about. But here's something also that year, which also didn't happen, as uh -huh. you know. We expect that sometime this spring, God will commence to set up his peaceful kingdom in the Holy Land. Mm -hmm. Daniel 2. We've got a, a chart here. Mm -hmm. Daniel 2 shows the world kingdoms, Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome mm -hmm. on one side. And then a stone. People can look this up in the Bible. It's a very mysterious. It says, in the days of these final kings, which yes. is the latter age of what we call the Roman, Holy Roman Empire, which is European sure. culture, mm -hmm. extends to America too. The God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed and yeah. break in pieces. You see the image there where it's breaking. Uh -huh. And uh, and then there'll be a war 
Now that's all through the Bible. Everybody knows. Some people call it the Battle of Armageddon. Right. Mm -hmm. That's all through the Bible. The main passage you mentioned here is Zechariah 14, mm -hmm. where these nations come down and surround Jerusalem. Yeah. And from your standpoint in 1959, threaten a second Holocaust. Mm -hmm. So now the Jews have returned to the land of Israel, reestablished the state of Israel in 48. And now in 1959, 11 years after, they're all going to get wiped out mm -hmm. unless, unless God intervenes. Mm -hmm. And then uh, 1,260 days and so forth. So it sounds like you're still holding on, and yet yeah, the, everybody thought yeah. uh, that it was going to happen. So much so that when some of the brethren there... Um, were pushing me to continue the 11th hour call, my response to them was, we don't have a message. I have nothing to talk about. I, I have nothing to tell anybody. We said these events would take place and by this time they didn't happen. Mm -hmm. I don't know what's wrong, but we're wrong. Well, you're you're and, back to the drawing board. I'm yeah. back to the drawing board. And it's and it was devastating enough to me that uh, I didn't want anything to do with any of it. And it maybe took a few weeks for this to solidify and everything. Like you said, there's a little bit of flexibility. But it soon came to the point where then, and Mount Carmel had no more job for me because we stopped the, the 11th hour call. That was very costly on the ABC network. it's already you know. 12 o'clock. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. the our call. That's right, yeah, yeah. So there was no reason for me to stay, so then we did start looking for another job. Well, here I'd already gotten into radio in with the 11th hour call, so I did make the application way. as one of the other sure. students to go into secular radio, and I got hired at Marlin uh, Radio Station there, and they won't yeah. go into all that story, but it finally resulted in then I leaving Texas in 1961, moving to Astoria, Oregon, where I so you, was offered a job there. So you recognize the, uh, the way you took the disappointment of 1959 was that uh, uh, you humbly said that we've made a mistake. I'm, well, I'm wrong. Right, yeah. Now, that's rare, you know. Yeah. In human but it was, it was based on Brother Hardiff's writings, but if Brother Hardiff, if, if we're wrong on that, then he was not a true prophet. He was not the Elijah. But if wrong there, Ellen G. White was not a prophet. Yeah. We're wrong there. How far do you extrapolate this down to the point where you say, I don't want anything to do with this Bible even. There's nothing right. there. Sure. Well, at some point, God is saying, wait a minute, kid. Mm -hmm. You know, and I had to rethink. But it was so far sure. a stretch that this this is the Bible I used. I bought this in 1950 from Baylor University Bookstore. Mm -hmm. This is the Bible I used all the time. All my markings and everything are the Davidian Bible studies and everything. I couldn't read this Bible anymore. Sure. It just it it told of too much else. So um, I I put it away. Right. I really wasn't reading anything until I finally got the Living Bible, which is just a paraphrase, sure. and started reading it some. Sure. But I mean, I just message. about gave up my faith. You had to you rehabilitate. I, I really had to, yeah. yeah. Now Florence yeah. Uh, didn't stay either, but and you said you kept a relationship. You kept a relationship. She was kind yeah. of the leader. Yeah, and now, and her brother too. Could you tell us, Oliver though, Hermanson? Uh, you know, we got to talk to you a little bit before the interview, and. You told us this amazing story where the Seventh-day Adventist Church reached out to you and I think Florence and uh, several of the leading people went to, is D.C. the headquarters? They did, Washington, D.C., yeah. Because that needs to be told, too. Yeah, that's an amazing yeah, story, yeah. too. Before you do that, read mm -hmm. that letter <laughs> and before the disappointment. Where they're denouncing you. Just, just, you want okay. me to read it? Give us a little yeah. context yeah, on that. that. Yeah. I'll oh, let you read it. Deadly, after the disappointment, you know, as you said, you left, Florence left. And I know when you were going out before on these missionary teaching journeys, 
you personally, you showed us this letter, which is amazing. Now, this would be 51. I'm going back a little to show the yeah. contrast. Yeah, okay. But the Adventist church, the mother church, is getting very worried. Here's a letter from the president of the conference in Montana. That would be the whole state. Right, yeah. It starts out, Dear Brethren, to the Adventists, mm -hmm. Beware. Mm -hmm. The shepherd rod people are trying to get a foothold among our people in Montana. They sneak into the town and innocently ask who the church clerk is and get names and addresses. The one who's working most actively in Montana is Dudley Goff. Mm -hmm. Okay, so fast forward, 1951, they're warning against you and mm -hmm. all these people. Mm -hmm. And now you're disappointed. Mm -hmm. The whole world has crashed. Mm -hmm. uh, almost like the Millerite thing. Yeah, right. And, you know, they said we wept till dawn and all these. It it was such a contrast. But they didn't react like this. No, so not at all. Tell us what, what, happened. Yeah. what happened. See, there was such a contrast between the way they acted after the, our disappointment in '59 and uh, this, and yeah. prior to that, but also. When Brother Hauda first was meeting with them as a group with his message to begin with, they were very good, very understanding, very kind, and all of that. That changed They're when he worried. didn't recant. They worried. were getting worried. Yeah. And so we were a thorn in their side. For years. For all those years. So the difference between the beginning, the way they treated us, and during, and then the end, back to the you know, treating us decently. It was, they understood because they were birthed out of the Millerite movement, a yes. disappointment okay. that birthed the Seventh-day Adventist Church with Ellen G. White and A.G. Daniels and all of them, you know, and, and, uh, and Mr. White, Brother White there. Um, so they knew the disappointment that we had gone through and they understood and they came to us real heartfelt. So they it wasn't had compassion. It was real compassion. It wasn't a con job or anything like that. They really came to us and they wanted to help us understand. So much so they put the money where their mouth was and invited us to Washington, D.C., to the headquarters of the General Conference of Seventh day Adventists. Worldwide headquarters. Worldwide headquarters. Mm -hmm and leading theologians, Adventist theologians there to meet with our people hmm. so that, and, and giving us an opportunity to expound to them our teachings and them an opportunity to point out where we were wrong, made our state mistake that resulted in such a horrendous disappointment hmm. in, in a failed prediction. So they were unbelievable. And they're and welcome. They want you to come back, of course. Absolutely. And they were, it was, they were just super. And I was one of them there, and along with Florence and, uh, and her brother and uh, Merritt Wolf and, um, and three or four others there, you know. And uh, I gave a good number of the sermons to them uh, uh, because that's what I had been doing. Um, Bingham was not involved then in that aspect of it, but... Um, so but anyway, how, how did you feel representing it when you were beginning to doubt that maybe it's even true? Uh, you just wanted to sort it out, I guess. Yeah. Uh, that was what it really was. So we're presenting what we've been presenting all the time. We, tell us where we're wrong. Yeah, okay. Because it still made sense to you well, sure, chronologically. Yeah. It just hadn't happened. It and just hadn't happened. It just had not happened. Right, yeah. So you were in a, a state of confusion. This is right, yeah. And, and they couldn't help us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the, when it finally was over with, it hadn't changed anything of what we'd been teaching, but we were wrong, ah, you know. Yeah. Well, if that's the case, then I guess I don't want any part of any of it. Right. You know, I'm through. Right. But see, and even so, though, if I'm listening to you right, even though the plagues didn't fall mm -hmm. and people dropped dead and all of this, you couldn't go back on the plain reading of Scripture that yeah. say the kingdom is going to get set up in right. Jerusalem and there's going to be this final war. And this is right. not an allegory. This is actually... Yeah. And there was a... Remember, 1956 was a major conflict between Israel and Egypt. And yeah. So there were 
things going on. Right. So you can't, you probably had trouble, I would think, throwing that off. Mm -hmm. And again, yes. a parallel with David Koresh in 93. Absolutely, yeah. Where there were things uh, <clears throat> that it ha he had been to Israel, he'd seen things. They mm -hmm. were actually, some of the military training that the Davidians were doing, mm -hmm. it wasn't to attack Americans. No. They wanted to help the Israelis. This is how strongly they believe it's the Bible. Yeah. That it, how are you going to go help Israel when all these nations attack Israel? Yeah. And we've got the IDF, the Israel Defense Force. Yeah. They're kind of like, well, we'll go and say we're here, 144,000 people. And yeah, we know how to use M16s and so forth. And we'll, mm -hmm. this is, we can prevent a yeah. Holocaust. They yeah. Prevent a Holocaust. They sure. believe this. They yeah. believe this. Yeah. And that's why Waco in 93 was such an absurdity that it happened because they never thought they were going to end in Waco, Texas. If anybody was going to die, it would be in, right. in Israel, yeah. where Zechariah says half of the city will be taken. Mm -hmm. You know, like, right. it's a real battle. Well, oh, it is, yeah. The, the women city. ravished, the houses rifled, it says. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, and Jerusalem's <laughs> divided, so you could see how people would read that and go, wow, mm -hmm. half the city, yeah, Jerusalem's sure. divided in yeah. half right yeah. now. So, this idea of taking the Bible literally like this and reading your own history under the Bible mm -hmm. is something characteristic, not just of your group, but other groups. Mm -hmm. But I think your group in particular and the, the, the uh, mm -hmm. chorus group, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, it seems to be a failing in a way. Mm -hmm. But is it, is it the people that are failing or is it the Bible that, you know, that's failing or is it the mm -hmm. interpretation? Of course, Bible believers would say, well, it can't be the Bible. It's only... Right, yeah. But I mean... And it goes back and You open the Bible and, and, and it yeah. does say there will be this battle and this yeah. is going to happen and that's going to happen. But doesn't it go back, Jim, you know, about to Masada and the, uh, yes. the Jewish uh, Essene warriors fighting off the Roman legions? Yeah. And they and they think it's in the prophecies. Absolutely. Look at they, Josephus. They yeah. thought that Jerusalem was not going to fall. Yeah. 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 Josephus is finding... The Roman Empire predicted in the scriptures himself in, what, 70 A.D.? Yeah. I See, teach a course on apocalypticism at University of North <clears throat> Carolina at Charlotte. It's a very popular course. I'm te teaching it in the spring. Mm -hmm. fills up to about 100 students. And I don't want to be cynical here, but here's what okay. I tell them the first day. Okay. This is a biblical apocalypticism through the ages, mm -hmm. and I include this and other mm -hmm. groups, mm -hmm. groups in the Middle Ages, early church, the yeah. Montanists, others. Mm -hmm. I say uh, we're about to emb embark on a study of an idea that has a 100% failure rate so far. And they're uh -huh. all sitting there. <laughs> 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 I said, oh, sure. Oh, boy. Right. We're going to study movement after movement uh -huh. after movement. That failed. Where they thought. Yeah. This was going to happen. Mm -hmm. And as one of my teachers at Chicago used to say about the first century, what they most expected <clears throat> to happen didn't come. Yeah. Jews were defeated. Yeah. Jerusalem destroyed. Yeah. What they least expected did happen. Yeah. The Roman Empire, rather than fall, this mm -hmm. image of the statue falling, right. Rome reached a heyday in the second and third century and started yeah. persecuting the Christians. Yeah. So it... It was completely... Uh, yeah. So. Well, you know, I could not uh, reject all the way to the Bible. I could reject Brother Hanif. I could reject the, the council, uh, Florence, you know, everything we believed as Davidians. I could reject Ellen G. White. But when they come all the way down to the source of their teachings, yeah. I couldn't reject this. Right. So God stopped me there. Yeah. yeah. I could have become an atheist and not believe in anything, say, and, not, and, and believe this is just uh, sure. a nothing, and I couldn't come to that. So something held me, at yeah. least, there. But what? Where do I go now? What do I do now? So I'm going to church on Sunday, Sunday churches, which I was doing. I sang in a 65-member choir for 10 years in a yeah. Sunday-keeping right. church. Um, it fed my ego pretty good, but it didn't do anything else. Yeah. Theologically, sure. everybody um, went different ways. You, yeah. I know you said some people went to Herbert Armstrong's group, the World. Right. My mother and my brother did. Yeah. And others 
probably my, my dad went back to Adventist Church. Right. Yeah, yeah, some went back, some fell away from any kind of faith. Yeah. Uh, right, yeah. What happened then there to, to New Mount Carmel? The, uh, uh, the, the, the Branch Davidians began right under the leadership of uh, some other people, uh, Rodans and so Another they, couple came in. Uh, yeah, yeah they continuity. came in, but see, I didn't want anything to do with any. Once I was gone, mm -hmm. I didn't want anything to do with any of it. I heard a little bit on the news of the gunfight between David Koresh and George Roden and a little of this, but no, I want nothing to do with it. I didn't want anyone to know that I was a, had been a Seventh-day Adventist. You were embarrassed. Yes, mm -hmm. let alone a Davidian. Right. You know. Right. So t I was totally Sick, yeah. separate and gone from this another life. And the only exception that I made is when I married Penny, my wife Penny, because um, I went through a divorce with mm -hmm. Carol. Yeah. When I married Penny, I felt it was not fair to her not to tell her of my past. Of course. Yeah. So I did tell her of my right. past. And um, and I did Raven that, that I'm married to now after Penny died, after 22 yeah. years, told her that. But <clears throat> otherwise, telling no one, I was in the closet in the sense. But some people didn't, stayed. Went, some people clearly, stayed at Mount at the prep. Yeah. And Perry Jones. And, yeah, uh, Perry Jones stayed. I, I don't oh, know. Oh, yeah, he did and all. Mm -hmm. But what I'm kind of leading to in this, mm -hmm. I was immersing myself in another world, another mm -hmm. life, <laughs> this other all forgotten until 1993 until 93 who would really? have thought who that would have thought suddenly your group was worldwide news this is right yeah that's amazing and i saw that happen i watched it day by day and all of this mm -hmm. but And knowing Perry Jones and friends I knew there, that are dead. Yeah. and I did nothing. And even now, I am ashamed of myself when I'm sitting next to two men who had nothing to do with the Davidians or Mount Carmel or anything else, had no history of it, but two men who then will step out and and see what's happening there and try to do something about it and went down to do it. And here I had a history and, that, and I didn't do anything about it. I didn't try to. I, I even thought of maybe, but I said, what can I do? I can't. And I'm ashamed that I did nothing to try to stop that. And, and I feel you guys, you picked up what I should have been doing when I had more justification for it and all. I mean, I just, I, and so I'm in awe of you guys well, and will, what you did. Not, and I put myself yeah. in the place like Peter. Peter was with Jesus all that time. And then he sees him taken and he's standing in the courtyard hearing people saying, you're a part of him. And he totally denies it. He didn't try to do anything. And he, he went out and wept. I mean, it was, it was a terrible blow to him. All that I had experienced with the Davidians beforehand, and now comes the, the real test. And I don't have the guts to make some effort in some way to help save the lives of those people there. And well, you guys that's did. That's one reason we're doing this. Yeah. And I think it'll end up being for good in a broad way, not just the Davidians, but yeah. we're going to talk a little bit in closing about lessons we learn here. Yeah. yeah. But I will say this, and I'm yeah. not just trying to whitewash your emotions and feelings yeah. here or say forget it. But the FBI was being so bombarded with people coming from everywhere, including Davidians. Uh -huh. I don't think it would you would have gotten through much uh -huh. because um, well, they tried to get me. I hid. Did they? 
Yeah. yeah, they tried to get me, but I was under my wife's phone number, and my boss wouldn't tell him where I was. Because yeah. I know Phil had him. a terrible time even getting. Yeah, they deflected, they tricked me, they, uh, you when, know, they yeah. gave me the impression. The way content. we uh -huh. were able to get through is a, a miracle, if you believe in miracles, and that is that Phil was in the Hilton Hotel in Waco making a call and ended up next to Dick DeGuerin's wife. They started talking. Well, she, she dropped some dropped of her purse and her cards fell her. out. And I just didn't know who she was, then, but I was helping pick up the cards, and then we yeah, introduced yeah. ourselves. And oh, so geez. she said, "Well, I guess you're a reporter." So, oh no, I'm a Bible, I'm a Bible scholar, and she said, "You need to talk to my husband." <laughs> and oh, he said, "Who's your my. husband?" Dick DeGuerin. Now he'd just seen David that day yeah. and was spending dozens and dozens of hours inside. Dick DeGuerin. And that's yeah. how we yeah. got in. Yeah. There's no way we would have got in ourselves just knocking on. You know, we know Is something. That right? let, us, yeah. let us talk. We know. And you're doing so much with your life now with helping uh, uh, people in Israel with uh, food and clothing and things like that. I mean, your life has become a just a stellar thing of doing so many great virtuous things. Uh, yeah. And just what we're doing today should help a lot of people. Because in the yeah. American tradition, yeah. there's got to be room, don't you think, Jim, for, uh, for groups to be able to express Absolutely. themselves and to study their religion and go ahead and live it out the way they think they See, should. See, we talk a lot of, to me, the whole lesson of all this is not just David Koresh or the Davidians or Hutta or anything. It's <clears throat> the First Amendment that we talk about a lot. Mm -hmm. What we summarize is freedom of religion, freedom of speech, and freedom of the press, those three things. And if, as they've been interpreted by the Supreme Court, Freedom of religion means freedom of religion. Yeah. And just because someone's very convicted and has a, what you'd consider to be a fairly crazy idea, mm -hmm. like the world's going to end on a certain date or you're studying this view or that view, yeah. our forefathers set up a scary experiment. <clears throat> it's very uh -huh. frightening to think about uh -huh. that we can say, believe, and think anything we want. Yeah. That is frightening in a way. Oh yeah. The good, the bad, threat. and the ugly. We deal with it all the time. Yeah. We get the Nazis that want to march and mm -hmm. uh, and we have safeguards. You know, we don't allow hate speech and it sounds like the your people were being very kind actually. Yeah. But, you know, you can't be racist and you can't uh, bash gays and different thing. You know, we no. we've had to work through that as a culture. Yeah. As far as religion goes, to me the lesson of Waco is that people who are sincerely convicted of things that are maybe inconceivable to someone else, and you would call it a cult or mm -hmm. these people are brainwashed or whatever, one man's <clears throat> cult is another person's right. religion. But it's not your defense of individuals that take those positions is not an endorsement of their position not at all. on it. Correct. Not at all. And it's the same thing here with David Koresh well and the Davidians That's there. Right. To support them was right. not saying. No. And if he you, broke the law, which right. he apparently did. But this is right. And you have to take the position. Now, I take the position what if? If everything is true, what the Fed said about David, what was going on there and with the group, if it was true, assuming it was true, mm -hmm. they still were wrong in not addressing the issues they should have. Yeah. They should have taken David any time they could have gotten him when he's gone shopping, gone down to the gym, gone <clears throat> to the gun show or whatnot, <clears throat> and taken him to the police station and arrested him. Did you know? And Phil, addressed these Phil things. Found out not too long ago, that he was here in Houston at yeah. the Seventh-day Adventist Library in yeah, a guitar shop right here in Houston just a few weeks before yeah, the Yeah, the raid. story was when I heard that this was happening in Waco, uh -huh. uh, after a week or so, I made my way to the Seventh-day Adventist Church here in Houston that was on Richmond Street back in those days. Uh, I'd never been a Seventh-day Adventist, but yeah. I knew of the church and I knew they had a good library, so I went uh -huh. there to research. Uh -huh. I spoke to the librarian. And I said, I'm here to get some information on this Branch Davidian group that's related to the uh, Davidian Seventh-day Adventist Church. 
uh, the shepherd's rod that was related to the Ellen G. White Seventh-day Adventist Church. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, there's some books back here. I said, yes, I want to find out more about David Koresh. Mm -hmm. Librarian said, well, guess what? He was here just about two, three weeks ago. Right here in the library. I don't think. I said, so he really? could have easily been arrested. Really? Why, well, sure. I, he said, yeah. yeah, he was going to the guitar store across the street. He came over to the church. Uh-huh. And uh, that's how accessible he was to law enforcement. Absolutely. So you're you're yeah. exact, exactly right Did about you know it. the local sheriff, Jack? <clears throat> uh, is it Harwell? Yeah, uh, Sheriff Harwell. He, he used to go out <clears throat> and sit in the front there and drink iced tea <clears throat> like you do in Texas. Yeah. You yeah. Know, with... With the Davidians, you know, he he could drive out there anytime. Yeah. David, David, oh, Sheriff, what you doing? What's going on? Right. So, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, but I think Jim makes a, a important point here about the United States with its Constitution is the first time I know of, and and I'm a historian, the first time I can think of in human history where you really have a a True constitutional protection freedom. where True. groups can go out and and express themselves according to their religious ideology any way they want to. Right. You see a little bit of that in Stuart England and later the Glorious Revolution of 1688 and down to the 18th century. You see some of that happening. Mm -hmm. But many of those, but there's still a state church there's in Great Britain. There's still a state church. There's still a lot of... And these, these groups, and that, it's true that sometimes you get characters who have visions and revelations that seem to yeah. be out of the ordinary. Yeah. But you also find that in the New Testament. Uh, I'm thinking of the Apostle Paul. Uh, his letter that he wrote to the Corinthians, he mm -hmm. writes in Second Corinthians that he himself ascended up to heaven and had revelations. Yeah. Uh, if I recall right, Doctor Tabor, you did your dissertation. I did. Yeah. On the heavenly ascents there of, yeah. of Paul. Paul. Yeah. Tried to put it in that tradition uh -huh. of. Um, well, Paul and Jesus himself. Jesus said things like, "I saw Satan fall as lightning from heaven." That's uh -huh. a vision. Yeah. Now people would say, yeah, but that's Jesus. He's the son of God. Well, that's from a Christian viewpoint. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But from a non-Christian viewpoint, the Romans, uh, the Jesus movement, you might want to call mm -hmm. it, is what some people today would call a cult. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, we, we are, what we try to do now in the history of religions, <clears throat> in academic study religion, is recognize that some religious uh, groups are we call it high demand. Mm -hmm. You know, they're really a, you know. They make high demand. If you take a mainstream church, you can be a member. It could even help your business and social life, and your children can go and meet influential people. It's just part of the culture. Mm -hmm. But there are these religions where, no, if you join this one, you kind of leave it all and follow. Well, that's how early Christianity was. Yeah. Jesus talked about leaving father, mother, brother, sister, right. children, and wife. Yeah. And imagine somebody today says, well, I'm going to leave my family because this is mm -hmm. the truth of God. In America, I mean, we're not encouraging any kind of, uh, I mean, we want everybody to prosper and do well, but you have the freedom to make that decision. Now, my recourse, if I'm your friend and I don't agree, is to try to rationally persuade you that you're probably reading that wrong and you mm -hmm. shouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. But I can't handcuff you or chain you no. or keep you. Do you know I get calls at the University of North Carolina all the time from parents? <clears throat> they might be saying, well, my child has started going to this or that. I notice you're in religious studies. You know, some group on campus. Could you yeah. maybe try to talk to them or keep them? You know, because maybe it's against what their family religion is. Yeah. <clears throat> we, this is America. Mm -hmm. We, we, we don't coerce people. And and you know, most most academics say brainwashing is a fiction. Right. Mm -hmm. To be brainwashed means a lot of Trump people are brainwashed. You're right. Hillary yeah. Clinton people are brainwashed. Yeah. Yeah. Brainwashing just means you're highly convicted and motivated about a position, be it religion, politics, or whatever. Do uh, you see this? Maybe you won't listen to reason. Well, yeah. 
most people don't listen to reason or right. hardly and, anything. And they feel you know? they are definitely persuaded. Now, don't you remember back in the late 70s, some of you do, and in, in the early 80s, mm -hmm. there was a, a phenomenon going on in this country called deprogramming. Yeah. There was yeah. a famous deprogrammer, Ted Patrick. Yeah. And he, you could pay him money, and he would kidnap your wife or your child. Yeah, unbelievable. And he would put yeah. them in an isolated place, yeah. give them a little bit of food and water, and then try to persuade them, brainwash them out of their newfound religious faith yeah. and back to whatever the family wanted them to believe. Yeah. Well, when, when I found that was happening in the United States, I said, this is contrary to the Constitution. Absolutely. This is yeah. unethical. Yeah. So I started a counseling service back in 1980 called reunion oh that's what we, and that's how i got yeah. started in the uh -huh. study of religion groups that are not in the mainstream and i tried my best to provide a family counseling so people who had differences could find some way of reconciling so when waco comes along i'm trying to reconcile find a resolution between law enforcement and the religious group so yeah. they won't have a terrible uh traumatic conclusion mm -hmm. to this class mm -hmm. and uh, so we need that I think in the United yeah. States. Well do you see this um, yeah. terrible treatment of those you disagree with as it's been carried out through the centuries that finally the last we're talking about here is um, David Koresh and the Branch Davidians. Do you see that as um, knowing about that, studying about it, talking about it and all, that that um, in some way can prepare us for the continuance. Yeah. I can say one positive word about it. You remember uh, probably two years, three years after Waco, I guess it was two years, 1995-96, uh, uh, there was a Montana standoff with the Montana Freeman. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. that, was, that was a standoff that went longer than Waco, and the FBI had to surround that community. But in that case, the Justice Department contacted religion scholars. Some of us were actually there giving the uh, advice to the Phil FBI. Went up, Phil went up there. I went up you personally. Both of you went up there. Huh? I didn't. Phil oh, did. well, I was yeah. on the phone and contacting others, yeah. and we, we were able to work closely with that group of FBI agents mm -hmm. under Louis Free and Robert Montgomery, and we were able to solve that problem peacefully. Uh -huh. None of the uh, members of that particular group uh, were harmed or, or died from it, and they surrendered, and they did go to jail, and some of them are still there to this day. Uh-huh. So that's a positive note. I think some sure. of those lessons were learned from Waco. Uh huh. Yeah. So I would like to think that that uh, what has happened in the in, in American history, going back to the Baptists who were not treated very well by the Congregations Puritans in the 17th century, mm -hmm. eventually they began to be tolerated mm -hmm. and then accepted. Same with the Quakers. Some Quakers, as we know, were hanged in Boston yeah. in the 1630s and 40s. Mm -hmm. But over the years... Just for being Quakers. Yeah, and yeah. protesting the churches that were sure. they disagreed with. Mm -hmm. But they were actually lost their lives over it. But over the years, there's been an understanding that when someone has a deeply held religious belief, they are appealing to something transcendent. They're not just saying, in my opinion... I don't like that road or I don't like that custom. They're actually saying, I believe there's a transcendent power that is that I'm in, that I believe in that doesn't want me to do that. That's called having an ultimate concern. Mm -hmm. So we, in our constitution, we now respect the fact that someone has an ultimate concern reason for doing or not doing something. We saw some of that transgress in 1993 with the Branch Davidians. But in Montana, that was recognized better. I look to the future where this principle of allowing people to follow their, their belief systems, and whether it's about uh, uh, what days they keep or what holidays they don't keep or whether they live in community or don't live in community or whatever they believe, as long as it's not impinging directly upon the safety of other people, mm -hmm. is respected. Yeah. I'm hopeful for that. Future. I think Islam is the challenge today because of... The what? Islam, yes, because of 9/11, yeah, and some very 
uh, fanatical and violent people that that are perverting that religion in that way so that we have a large body of people in America who mm-hmm. just say, just get them out of here, kill them, whatever. Mm-hmm. Similar to what they were saying about Baptists or Quakers mm-hmm. 300 years ago. Yeah. So, and even Roman Catholics. Remember yeah. when Roman Catholics first came? Uh, yeah. And Jews. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Country clubs, uh, all right. kinds of social things in the Northeast. Mm-hmm. You couldn't be part of that if you were a Catholic or a Jew. Yeah. And now yeah. it's book we don't have a Jewish president yet, but we've come close. Yeah. yeah. Well I would like to ask you, Dudley, is there anything else that you personally would like to add to our discussion today that maybe we've overlooked or that you feel strongly about? I think we have uh, covered uh, the historical and the personal aspects. Uh, would you like to I, have anything in conclusion? I wish I could someone could give me the answer to why why I again got somewhat involved and then involved with you guys and God bringing us together. What, what is his intent to be the outcome of this? I, I raised the question why I'd like the answer. And at this point, I don't know that I have the have the answer. I do know that I hid for all these years until only about a year ago that I decided then to talk to Rabbi Ron Aronson and tell him who I really was, right. you know, uh, in all of this. Uh, but I still fall back to even my son who said, Dad, you kept all of these materials all these years for some reason. Be ready for for God to show you the reason to open the door and all. And so I am ready for that, but uh, I don't have the answer You're yet. You're open to the future. I'm open to that. Maybe you guys have the answer to it. I don't know. Well, I think a lot of this material you brought, and we just brought a teeny little sample. We could fill five tables here with that material that you saved. Uh, mm-hmm. This can become part of the archive of the history. I'm thinking academically, of course. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it isn't in vain that you've kept this. Uh, people who want to study these things. I see someday somebody will write a PhD dissertation at Baylor or any university, you know, and the, 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 these are primary sources. Primary source material. That are very mm-hmm. valuable. Mm-hmm. Um, so that that's more would be my answer as far as a greater transcendent thing i don't i don't have anything like that that i can articulate i do know during waco phil and i had these experiences like getting connected to to daguerre's wife Mm -hmm. even though it ended up tragic Mm -hmm. it seemed like we were being pulled along in a certain way. Mm-hmm. And I think most of us try to live our lives that way. Yeah. Whether we have this faith or that faith or how you mm-hmm. define God or mm-hmm. whatever, we all ask that question, what's it all about? Yeah. You know, what's it all about? Yeah. And we know we're all going to die. Yeah. And so we wonder, um, you know, how can we best use our lives? Well, at my age, 87, I'm getting close to the reality of that, yeah. of the dying. And so the the question is very, very well, weird to me. Well, certainly you have, have for you. yeah, you've, the contact we had earlier this year and so forth, we're, uh, I think you're, in, you're taking the right steps at least. Mm-hmm. Well, I think this interview can be very important. Yeah, because uh-huh. there are going to be hundreds and perhaps thousands of people viewing this at some point in the future. Uh-huh. You cannot, and I cannot, and Dr. Tabor cannot predict how that's going to be understood and used and developed for mm-hmm. good. Mm-hmm. You know, there is something in, uh, in theology, and it's a Latin phrase, fides querens intellectu. It's uh-huh. faith seeking understanding. Uh-huh. We don't have all understanding. No. So you start with faith, Yeah. but it's a faith that wants to be informed by understanding, Yeah. not blind faith. Right. But we all have this faith and we're seeking this further enlightenment and understanding. Mm-hmm. So you can't get it and demand it. Right, know? yeah. And so that understanding is mm-hmm. coming to us all. Yeah, That's yeah. 
part of the faith process. Right. Yeah. I want to thank everyone for uh, listening, and I want to thank our guest today, Dr. James Tabor from the University of North Carolina at Charlotte, and Dudley Goff from Southern California. Mm -hmm. So good to have you here. Thank you for sharing. And Thanks for inviting welcome. us. Yeah, you bet. Thank Appreciate you. Thank you. It.